1 Kings chapter 1 When King David was old and well advanced in years, he could not keep warm, even when they put covers over him. So his servants said to him, Let us look for a young virgin to attend the king and take care of him. She can lie beside him so that our lord the king may keep warm. Then they searched throughout Israel for a beautiful girl, and found Abishag, a Shunammite, and brought her to the king. The girl was very beautiful. She took care of the king and waited on him, but the king had no intimate relations with her. Now Adonijah, whose mother was Haggith, put himself forward and said, I will be king. So he got chariots and horses ready, with fifty men to run ahead of him. His father had never interfered with him by asking, Why do you behave as you do? He was also very handsome and was born next after Absalom. Adonijah conferred with Joab son of Zeruiah and with Abiathar the priest, and they gave him their support. But Zadok the priest, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, Nathan the prophet, Shimei and Rei and David's special guard did not join Adonijah. Adonijah then sacrificed sheep, cattle, and fattened calves at the stone of Zoholith near Enrogel. He invited all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah who were royal officials, but he did not invite Nathan the prophet, or Benaiah, or the special guard, or his brother Solomon. Then Nathan asked Bathsheba, Solomon's mother, Have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king without our lord David's knowing it? Now then, let me advise you how you can save your own life and the life of your son Solomon. Go in to King David and say to him, My lord the king, did you not swear to me, your servant, Surely Solomon your son shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne? Why then has Adonijah become king? While you are still there talking to the king, I will come in and confirm what you have said. So Bathsheba went to see the aged king in his room where Abishag the Shunammite was attending him. Bathsheba bowed low and knelt before the king. What is it you want? The king asked. She said to him, My lord, you yourself swore to me, your servant, by the Lord your God. Solomon your son shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne. But now Adonijah has become king, and you, my lord the king, do not know about it. He has sacrificed great numbers of cattle, fattened calves and sheep, and has invited all the king's sons, Abiathar the priest and Joab the commander of the army. But he has not invited Solomon your servant. My lord the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you to learn from you who will sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise... As soon as my lord the king is laid to rest with his fathers, I and my son Solomon will be treated as criminals. While she was still speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet arrived. And they told the king, Nathan the prophet is here. So he went before the king and bowed with his face to the ground. Nathan said, Have you, my lord the king, declared that Adonijah shall be king after you and that he will sit on your throne? Today he has gone down and sacrificed great numbers of cattle, fattened calves and sheep. He has invited all the king's sons, the commanders of the army, and Abiathar the priest. Right now they are eating and drinking with him and saying, Long live King Adonijah! But me, your servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah son of Jehoiada, and your servant Solomon he did not invite. Is this something my lord the king has done without letting his servants know who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? Then King David said, Call in Bathsheba. So she came into the king's presence and stood before him. The king then took an oath. As surely as the Lord lives, who has delivered me out of every trouble, I will surely carry out today what I swore to you by the Lord the God of Israel. Solomon, your son, shall be king after me, and he will sit on my throne in my place. Then Bathsheba bowed low with her face to the ground, and kneeling before the king, said, May my lord King David live forever. King David said, Call in Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah son of Jehoiada. 
When they came before the king, he said to them, Take your Lord's servants with you, and set Solomon my son on my own mule, and take him down to Gihon. There have Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him king over Israel. Blow the trumpet and shout, Long live King Solomon! Then you are to go up with him, and he is to come and sit on my throne and reign in my place. I have appointed him ruler over Israel and Judah. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, answered the king, Amen. May the Lord, the God of my lord the king, so declare it. As the Lord was with my lord the king, so may he be with Solomon, to make his throne even greater than the throne of my lord king David. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, the Carathites and the Pelathites, went down and put Solomon on King David's mule and escorted him to Gihon. Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the sacred tent and anointed Solomon. Then they sounded the trumpet and all the people shouted, Long live King Solomon! And all the people went up after him, playing flutes and rejoicing greatly, so that the ground shook with the sound. Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they were finishing their feast. On hearing the sound of the trumpet, Joab asked, What's the meaning of all the noise in the city? Even as he was speaking, Jonathan, son of Abiathar the priest, arrived. Adonijah said, Come in. A worthy man like you must be bringing good news. Not at all, Jonathan answered. Our lord King David has made Solomon king. The king has sent with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah son of Jehoiada, the Carathites and the Pelathites, and they have put him on the king's mule. And Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king at Gihon. From there they have gone up cheering, and the city resounds with it. That's the noise you hear. Moreover, Solomon has taken his seat on the royal throne. Also, the royal officials have come to congratulate our lord King David, saying, May your God make Solomon's name more famous than yours, and his throne greater than yours. And the king bowed in worship on his bed, and said, Praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has allowed my eyes to see a successor on my throne today. At this, all Adonijah's guests rose in alarm and dispersed. But Adonijah, in fear of Solomon, went and took hold of the horns of the altar. Then Solomon was told, Adonijah is afraid of King Solomon and is clinging to the horns of the altar. He says, Let King Solomon swear to me today that he will not put his servant to death with the sword. Solomon replied, If he shows himself to be a worthy man, not a hair of his head will fall to the ground. But if evil is found in him, he will die. Then King Solomon sent men, and they brought him down from the altar. And Adonijah came and bowed down to King Solomon. And Solomon said, Go to your home. Chapter 2 When the time drew near for David to die, he gave a charge to Solomon his son. I am about to go the way of all the earth, he said. So be strong, show yourself a man, and observe what the Lord your God requires. Walk in his ways, and keep his decrees and commands, his laws and requirements, as written in the law of Moses so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go, and that the Lord may keep his promise to me if your descendants watch how they live and if they walk faithfully before me with all their heart and soul, you will never fail to have a man on the throne of Israel. Now you yourself know what Joab, son of Zeruiah, did to me what he did to the two commanders of Israel's armies, Abner, son of Ner, and Amasa, son of Jether. He killed them, shedding their blood in peacetime as if in battle, and with that blood stained the belt around his waist and the sandals on his feet. Deal with him according to your wisdom, but do not let his gray head go down to the grave in peace. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai of Gilead, and let them be among those who eat at your table. They stood by me when I fled from your brother Absalom. And remember, you have with you Shimei, son of Gera, the Benjamite from Bahurim, 
who called down bitter curses on me the day I went to Mahanaim. When he came down to meet me at the Jordan, I swore to him by the Lord, I will not put you to death by the sword. But now do not consider him innocent. You are a man of wisdom. You will know what to do to him. Bring his gray head down to the grave in blood. Then David rested with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. He had reigned forty years over Israel, seven years in Hebron, and thirty-three in Jerusalem. So Solomon sat on the throne of his father David, and his rule was firmly established. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, went to Bathsheba, Solomon's mother. Bathsheba asked him, Do you come peacefully? He answered, Yes, peacefully. Then he added, I have something to say to you. You may say it, she replied. As you know, he said, the kingdom was mine. All Israel looked to me as their king. But things changed, and the kingdom has gone to my brother, for it has come to him from the Lord. Now I have one request to make of you. Do not refuse me. You may make it, she said. So he continued, Please ask King Solomon, he will not refuse you, to give me Abishag the Shunammite as my wife. Very well, Bathsheba replied. I will speak to the king for you. When Bathsheba went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah, the king stood up to meet her, bowed down to her. Chapter 3 Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places, because the temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the statutes of his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant, my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this great kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, O Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David, but I am only a little child and do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment in administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor, so that in your lifetime, you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in my ways and obey my statutes and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. Then Solomon awoke, and he realized it had been a dream. He returned to Jerusalem, stood before the ark of the Lord's covenant, and sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings. Then he gave a feast for all his court. Now two prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. One of them said, My lord, this woman and I live in the same house. I had a baby while she was there with me. The third day after my child was born, this woman also had a baby. We were alone. There was no one in the house but the two of us. During the night, this woman's son died because she lay on him. So she got up in the middle of the night and took my son from my side while I, your servant, was asleep. She put him by her breast and put her dead son by my breast. The next morning, I got up to nurse my son, and he was dead. But when I looked at him closely in the morning light, I saw that it wasn't the son I had born. 
The other woman said, No, the living one is my son. The dead one is yours. But the first one insisted, No, the dead one is yours. The living one is mine. And so they argued before the king. The king said, This one says, My son is alive and your son is dead. While that one says, No, your son is dead and mine is alive. Then the king said, Bring me a sword. So they brought a sword for the king. He then gave an order. Cut the living child in two, and give half to one, and half to the other. The woman whose son was alive was filled with compassion for her son, and said to the king, Please, my lord, give her the living baby. Don't kill him. But the other said, Neither I nor you shall have him. Cut him in two. Then the king gave his ruling. Give the living baby to the first woman. Do not kill him. She is his mother. When all Israel heard the verdict the king had given, they held the king in awe, because they saw that he had wisdom from God to administer justice. Chapter 4 So King Solomon ruled over all Israel, and these were his chief officials. Azariah, son of Zadok, the priest. Elahoreph and Ahijah, sons of Shisha, secretaries. Jehoshaphat, son of Ahilad, recorder. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, commander-in-chief. Zadok and Abiathar, priests. Azariah, son of Nathan, in charge of the district officers. Zabad, son of Nathan, a priest and personal advisor to the king. Ahishar, in charge of the palace. Adoniram, son of Abda, in charge of forced labor. Solomon also had twelve district governors over all Israel, who supplied provisions for the king and the royal household. Each one had to provide supplies for one month in the year. These are their names. Ben-Hur, in the hill country of Ephraim. Ben-Deker, in Mekaz, Sheolbim, Beth Shemesh, and Elan, Beth Hanan. Ben-Hesed, in Araboth, Soko, and all the land of Hefer were his. Ben-Abinadab, in Naphoth Dor. He was married to Tephath, daughter of Solomon. Beena, son of Ahilad, in Teanak and Megiddo, and in all of Beth Shan, next to Zarethan, below Jezreel, from Beth Shan to Abel Mahala, across to Jachmium. Ben Geber, in Ramoth Gilead. The settlements of Jair, son of Manasseh, in Gilead were his, as well as the district of Argob in Bashan, and its sixty large walled cities with bronze gate bars. Ahinadab, son of Iddo, in Mahanaim. Ahimeaz, in Naphtali, he had married Basimath, daughter of Solomon. Baana, son of Hushai, in Asher and in Aloth. Jehoshaphat, son of Perua, in Issachar. Shimei, son of Elah, in Benjamin. Geber, son of Uri, in Gilead, the country of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and the country of Og, king of Bashan. He was the only governor over the district. The people of Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They ate, they drank, and they were happy. And Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the river to the land of the Philistines as far as the border of Egypt. These countries brought tribute and were Solomon's subjects all his life. Solomon's daily provisions were thirty cores of fine flour and sixty cores of meal, ten head of stall-fed cattle, twenty of pasture-fed cattle, and a hundred sheep and goats, as well as deer, gazelles, roebucks, and choice fowl. For he ruled over all the kingdoms west of the river, from Tifsa to Geza, and had peace on all sides. During Solomon's lifetime, Judah and Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, lived in safety, each man under his own vine and fig tree. Solomon had four thousand stalls for chariot horses, and twelve thousand horses. The district officers, each in his month, supplied provisions for King Solomon and all who came to the king's table. They saw to it that nothing was lacking. They also brought to the proper place their quotas of barley and straw for the chariot horses and the other horses. God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight and a breadth of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the men of the east and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than any other man, including Ethan, the Ezraite, wiser than Heman, Calchol, 
and Darda, the sons of Mahal. And his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke three thousand proverbs, and his songs numbered a thousand and five. He described plant life, from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He also taught about animals and birds, reptiles and fish. Men of all nations came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. Chapter five. When Hiram, king of Tyre, heard that Solomon had been anointed king to succeed his father David, he sent his envoys to Solomon, because he had always been on friendly terms with David. Solomon sent back this message to Hiram: You know that because of the wars waged against my father David from all sides, he could not build a temple for the name of the Lord his God until the Lord put his enemies under his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side, and there is no adversary or disaster. I intend, therefore, to build a temple for the name of the Lord my God, as the Lord told my father David when he said, "Your son, whom I will put on the throne in your place, will build the temple for my name." So give orders that cedars of Lebanon be cut for me. My men will work with yours. And I will pay you for your men whatever wages you set. You know that we have no one so skilled in felling timber as the Sidonians. When Hiram heard Solomon's message, he was greatly pleased and said, "Praise be to the Lord today, for He has given David a wise son to rule over this great nation." So Hiram sent word to Solomon, "I have received the message you sent me, and will do all you want in providing the cedar and pine logs." My men will haul them down from Lebanon to the sea, and I will float them in rafts by sea to the place you specify. There I will separate them, and you can take them away. And you are to grant my wish by providing food for my royal household. In this way, Hiram kept Solomon supplied with all the cedar and pine logs he wanted, and Solomon gave Hiram twenty thousand cores of wheat as food for his household, in addition to twenty thousand baths of pressed olive oil. Solomon continued to do this for Hiram year after year. The Lord gave Solomon wisdom, just as He had promised him. There were peaceful relations between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. King Solomon conscripted laborers from all Israel, thirty thousand men. He sent them off to Lebanon in shifts of ten thousand a month, so that they spent one month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the forced labor. Solomon had seventy thousand carriers. And eighty thousand stone cutters in the hills, as well as thirty-three hundred foremen who supervised the project and directed the workmen. At the king's command, they removed from the quarry large blocks of quality stone to provide a foundation of dressed stone for the temple. The craftsmen of Solomon and Hiram and the men of Gebel cut and prepared the timber and stone for the building of the temple. Chapter six. In the four hundred and eightieth year after the Israelites had come out of Egypt. In the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, the second month, he began to build the temple of the Lord. The temple that King Solomon built for the Lord was sixty cubits long, twenty wide, and thirty high. The portico at the front of the main hall of the temple extended the width of the temple, that is, twenty cubits, and projected ten cubits from the front of the temple. He made narrow, clear story windows in the temple. Against the walls of the main hall and inner sanctuary, he built a structure around the building, in which there were side rooms. The lowest floor was five cubits wide, the middle floor six cubits, and the third floor seven. He made offset ledges around the outside of the temple, so that nothing would be inserted into the temple walls. In building the temple, only blocks dressed at the quarry were used, and no hammer, chisel. Or any other iron tool was heard at the temple site while it was being built. The entrance to the lowest floor was on the south side of the temple. A stairway led up to the middle level, and from there to the third. So he built the temple and completed it, roofing it with beams and cedar planks. And he built the side rooms all along the temple. The height of each was five cubits, and they were attached to the temple by beams of cedar. The word of the Lord came to Solomon. As for this temple you are building, if you follow my decrees, carry out my regulations, and keep all my commands and obey them, 
I will fulfill through you the promise I gave to David your father, and I will live among the Israelites and will not abandon my people Israel. So Solomon built the temple and completed it. He lined its interior walls with cedar boards, paneling them from the floor of the temple to the ceiling, and covered the floor of the temple with planks of pine. He partitioned off twenty cubits at the rear of the temple with cedar boards from floor to ceiling to form within the temple an inner sanctuary, the most holy place. The main hall in front of this room was forty cubits long. The inside of the temple was cedar, carved with gourds and open flowers. Everything was cedar. No stone was to be seen. He prepared the inner sanctuary within the temple to set the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord there. The inner sanctuary was twenty cubits long, twenty wide, and twenty high. He overlaid the inside with pure gold, and he also overlaid the altar of cedar. Solomon covered the inside of the temple with pure gold, and he extended gold chains across the front of the inner sanctuary, which was overlaid with gold. So he overlaid the whole interior with gold. He also overlaid with gold the altar that belonged to the inner sanctuary. In the inner sanctuary, he made a pair of cherubim of olive wood, each ten cubits high. One wing of the first cherub was five cubits long and the other wing five cubits, ten cubits from wingtip to wingtip. The second cherub also measured ten cubits, for the two cherubim were identical in size and shape. The height of each cherub was ten cubits. He placed the cherubim inside the innermost room of the temple, with their wings spread out. The wing of one cherub touched one wall, while the wing of the other touched the other wall, and their wings touched each other in the middle of the room. He overlaid the cherubim with gold. On the walls all around the temple, in both the inner and outer rooms, he carved cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. He also covered the floors of both the inner and outer rooms of the temple with gold. For the entrance of the inner sanctuary, he made doors of olive wood with five-sided jams. And on the two olive wood doors, he carved cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, and overlaid the cherubim and palm trees with beaten gold. In the same way, he made four-sided jams of olive wood for the entrance to the main hall. He also made two pine doors, each having two leaves that turned in sockets. He carved cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers on them, and overlaid them with gold hammered evenly over the carvings. And he built the inner courtyard of three courses of dressed stone, and one course of trimmed cedar beams. The foundation of the temple of the Lord was laid in the fourth year, in the month of Ziv. In the eleventh year, in the month of Bull, the eighth month, the temple was finished in all its details according to its specifications. He had spent seven years building it. Psalm 72 of Solomon Endow the king with your justice, O God, the royal son with your righteousness. He will judge your people in righteousness, your afflicted ones with justice. The mountains will bring prosperity to the people, the hills the fruit of righteousness. He will defend the afflicted among the people and save the children of the needy. He will crush the oppressor. He will endure as long as the sun, as long as the moon, through all generations. He will be like rain falling on a mown field, like showers watering the earth. In his days the righteous will flourish. Prosperity will abound till the moon is no more. He will rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. The desert tribes will bow before him and his enemies will lick the dust. The kings of Tarshish and of distant shores will bring tribute to him. The kings of Sheba and Seba will present him gifts. All kings will bow down to him, and all nations will serve him. For he will deliver the needy who cry out, the afflicted who have no one to help. He will take pity on the weak and the needy, and save the needy from death. He will rescue them from oppression and violence, for precious is their blood in his sight. Long may he live. May gold from Sheba be given him. May people ever pray for him and bless him all day long. Let grain abound throughout the land. On the tops of the hills may it sway. Let its fruit flourish like Lebanon. Let it thrive like the grass of the field. May his name endure forever. May it continue as long as the sun. All nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed. Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. 
Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. This concludes the prayers of David, son of Jesse.